What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to Double Coverage. Hope you're still living, loving, and breathing sport. I'm Dom with the great man, Sauce, and special guest podcast here for everyone listening. Uh, Saucy, who have we got with us today? Doma, good to be on for another special edition of the podcast. Uh, we've got Jono Michaels from Mailman Breaks, uh, breaking over at uh, Sports Cards Addict Australia Facebook group. So uh, make sure you check them out. We will have the link to that in the description so you can uh, join that Facebook group and join in on some of Jono's breaks down there at Mailman. Jono, how are you, mate? Going well, boys. Thanks for having me on today. It's a nice public holiday, so I spend a bit of time with you boys and then watch a bit of footy later, so I can't complain. It's been a long time coming, uh, this one. I know we've, uh, I think we met you at, for the first time at a uh, card show. I think it was one of the Melbourne card card fairs at North Melbourne. That was the first time we were like informally, formally introduced to each other and we'd obviously known about each other. And then from there, mate, uh, we've got a chat and we talk shit now and we talk shit about each other to each other and it's always good fun. So it's, it's really good that we can finally get you on and, uh, actually do this interview so we'll start off with the easy ones and then we might have to get into some complex ones but just nice and easy for our, when you started collecting and what you like to collect in the hobby it's actually it's actually a, a funny story this one i uh I was, I was 10 years old um i was, I was a kid that was born up uh, and grown up in the 90s when there was a huge car boom i used to collect footy cards and footy stickers so footy stickers was my thing. Loved getting the footy stickers and putting in my album. But then I had my first introduction to uh, basketball cards when we we're on a family trip in the USA. Uh, in my head, going to America was going to Disneyland. It didn't really <laughs> pan out that way. I remember um, my family and I and our family friends were in San Francisco, actually. And we're at breakfast at the hotel and we're talking about going on a, uh, a touristy day, which a 10-year-old kid didn't seem so uh, enticing. And as we're going back upstairs to our room, there was a sign that said basketball card fair. It's 100% a true story. So my dad said, let's go have a quick look. And we went and had a look. And the deal that he made me with me was, was he gave me a budget. He said, you can spend your money on whatever you want. So I bought three boxes of basketball cards. Two of them were a brand called Classic, which were actually uh, college cards at the time. And one was a box of 93, 94 Upper Deck. My dad took me upstairs to the room. He put the TV on. He gave me some snacks. And he said, what we're going to do is we're going to lock you in the room, put the chain on the door, don't answer it for everyone, and just sit in the room for two hours while we go on a little tourist expedition of San Francisco and you can just sit there and uh, rip open some cards and watch some TV by yourself. So it probably wouldn't happen these days as a 10 year old, just being left in a hotel room by himself. But I, Sounds a bit uh, like a home alone sort of story, mate. You could have got up to anything, you know? Oh, I know. <laughs> and I, uh, I remember ripping it and I've still got one of the cards from uh, today. It's a, uh, it was a picture of Shaq in a t-shirt and shorts holding two balls um, and as I said, that was from a, a brand called Classic, which at the time I didn't even know when I bought the box was a uh, a college brand, and that's when my my love of basketball cards uh, started. So did obviously you, play you come when back you, when you were younger. I did. I started playing basketball. I think either under sevens or eights, but uh, basketball cards was just starting to get a bit popular in Australia. It was more of a, a footy card. Thing, but then lots of lots of basketball card stores started popping up in the early 90s. Um, so, you know, as soon as I'd come back from that trip, my uh, my weekends basically revolved around going to the different card stores, what's new, guess what, card cowboy, card heaven, just collectibles. Yeah, talk, um, talk about that because in the early 90s, like there was a lot of card stores that were, you know, that popped up because there was a massive interest in, in card collecting. Uh, back then, um, and, and I mean, it all died, and we, we sort of know what happened and what ha happened in, in the end, you know, going into the the two thousands and that. But there was card shops everywhere. Yeah, it was it was unbelievable. Um, you know, you used to used to 
tell little white fibs to your parents, you know, I need some money to uh, go to the movies with your friends. Or you used to say you're going to time zone and then you'd you'd sneak off to uh, what's new in Chadston or one of the car stores and buy a couple of packs where they're, they're a lot more affordable than they were these days. Um, I remember I used to go and spend three, four bucks, get a pack of Upper Decks, Skybox, Fleer, mm-hmm. some of the, uh, the real retro brands. Um, but yeah, it was there were there were card stores everywhere, and, and once I um, built that love of cards and my interest in basketball was growing. Um, yeah, my weekends were basically just spent going from card shop to card shop, um, trying to trade with the stores where you, you didn't get very favorable deals, but all, all, also meeting lots of other collectors in stores. Um, lots of stores had little trading tables where you could meet other people, trade with them, um, try try and try and sell a few cards. So you had enough money to buy a few more packs. So it was it was definitely a uh, a fun period growing up in the nineties with card stores all over Melbourne where I where I grew up. So are you able to give a Sorry, go are ahead. you able to give a bit of insight into as Saucy did mention, like what happened, like that turn in the hobby for i don't know now obviously your involvement you may have a better understanding than what you did when you were a young kid but what happened there where we pretty much just saw uh card shops become scarce and practically non-existent they'll sell sold more at like those retail stores than actual dedicated card shops yeah so obviously when when you're a young kid in the 90s you don't really understand what was happening but i do remember my friends and I, our, our interest just literally waned. Felt like all the price of the cars fell off a cliff. You know, we used to quickly run to the news agent first every month and pick up our our Beckett magazine to see how much our our cars are worth. And then there was a period. I'm going to say it was late '90s where the price of cars just plummeted. Um, and at the time. You're a young kid and you're like, well, you know, what was why is this card going from 20 bucks to, to ten dollars? And you didn't really understand it. But obviously now looking at it where they call it the uh the junk wax era, there was just so much product being manufactured. There wasn't there was, you know, you, you look now and, and you see an old retro box getting ripped and the numbered cards that are two thousand nine hundred and ninety nine, six thousand nine hundred and ninety nine. So they're just mass producing everything because there was such a huge demand. And obviously we're only talking about Australia where obviously the market was still quite small compared to, you know, around the world. So now looking back at it, you can, you can comprehend what happened. But as a kid, you were like, why are my cars worth nothing? You know, I'm not, it wasn't even just worth nothing. It was, it was as a kid, you wanted your car to be worth something so you could trade it for something better. And I guess it's the same now, you know, no one wants their assets, um, whether it be sports cards or anything else to go down. Um, so yeah, obviously a lot, a lot more understanding of what happened now, but as a kid, it was very hard to comprehend, um, while or why all my, uh, so-called treasured possessions were now worth, uh, very minimal amounts. Have you got any, uh, any stories from when you were a kid in terms of like ripping a pack and uh, with your mates and hitting something that was just massive or that was big at the time that or something or a story where you ripped something, you pulled something and it, was, it ended up becoming a massive card and you were like, yeah, I traded that for, for I don't know, whoever it was, white chocolate. Or another pack. Uh, rookie card or something or another pack. Yeah, I've, I've, got, I've got a story and... I, I actually, I don't know the exact card. I was trying to think about it last night. Um, it was actually the biggest pull I've ever personally had. So um, old mate Wangy used to have a, a store on the opposite side of uh, Victoria Market from where he is now. And again, I remember I told my parents, well, me and a mate were going to Time Zone and a movie and they gave me, they gave me 50 bucks, which was a lot of money those days. And me and a mate, we went to went to La Pocetta on the corner and shared a pizza. And then we went into a went into Wangy's store and I bought a pack. I'm gonna say it was called Upper Deck XP. 
and it was about a forty dollar pack. And you're talking about in the mid nineties, where a lot of the packs were five, six, seven dollars. And I pulled a Jordan Redemption. And at that stage in the 90s, all redemptions were purely for pay, for US residents. Like a, on the back, if you go, they used to be called lottery cards or redemptions. And it said, you must be a US resident to claim this card. Um, didn't know what card it was. Couldn't find it in the Beckett. I was a bit unsure of what it was. Um, and then the following week, I went to a card store on Glen Ferry Road, Hawthorne, with a mate of mine. I said, listen, I've just pulled this card. And we looked it up in the Beckett, and it was valued at $6,000. And this is in the mid-90s. So I'd hate to think what card it was, but I remember it was a signed Jordan card with a game-worn patch. So it's probably worth a fair bit of money now. And the way the card shops used to work was, was say, for example, a card was worth six grand in the Beckett. I'll say, oh, we'll give you four grand cash, a six grand, a six grand trade. Of course, you're a kid. You're like, yeah, I'm trading. I'm not taking the cash. Yeah. So a mate, a mate of mine, and me, we sat in this car store all day. Um, they had a little table at the back with chairs, and we thought we were kings. I would have been about thirteen or fourteen. And this is the point. Yep, I'll take that box, that box, that box, that box, and we sat there for about eight hours just ripping boxes for the trade of this Jordan signed redemption. Hit absolutely nothing, but it was one of the best days of my life. We probably ripped. I'm talking about oh, probably that would have been a lot of boxes. boxes. 30 to 50 boxes of cards. And we and we sat there and we we're ripping them and quickly chucking away the commons. We used to put the uh, inserts in our, you know, our, our nine sleeves in our in our album. Yeah. The nine pocket sleeves, and uh, I'd hate to think now what that Jordan Redemption was. And I, I you know, probably I'm sold. You never know. It's probably sold a couple of times on Golden. Yeah, or I've, I've on PWCC or. I've thought about it like hundreds of times. What was that card? Um, probably worth a, a small fortune now, but geez, we had fun that day. Oh, but you got the memory, there mate. You go. Ripping boxes all day. It's shit. Just imagine telling a kid you can trade a card for 30 boxes that you can rip. And they'll be like, what? 30 boxes? Well, I'll trade the card for one box of flawless. You can't even get flawless for six grand. So I don't even know why I said flawless. So who knows what you're buying? Well, so for three boxes of WWE Prism. Yeah. That's, no. what you're, <laughs> that's what you're trading a Jordan Redemption for. Like, it was, it was definitely, definitely a uh, definitely a fun day. No, nah, it's awesome. That's a good memory to have. Very good memory to have. And a great story as well. Uh, your involvement in the hobby, obviously, you get a lot older. You come back into the into the hobby while cards are now starting to become worth a bit more. And obviously, your knowledge of uh, the products and just your involvement, uh, breaking-wise, uh, collecting-wise, uh, just within the hobby. Yeah, so I uh, I came back into the hobby in early 2019. A mate of mine was very uh, entrenched in the AFL world and he was telling me about this product called Supremacy. And he was telling me that there was, you know, 10 cards and it cost $500 a box and I thought he was mad. I'm like, what, what, what box of cards cost 500 bucks and you get 10 cards? You know, something so foreign to me compared to what what we went through in the mid '90s, where you know you're buying packs of cars, boxes of cars that had 24 packs, 36 packs. Um, and I caught the bug again when so I joined NBA Card Market, and the first Raz I ever entered, I won a box of uh, 1920 Optic Fast Break. Uh, box came in the mail. Couldn't wait. Ran upstairs, had the kids downstairs, and the first pack I opened, and I hit a jam round fast break auto. And I was all, I've always been a huge basketball fan, so I, I've always followed basketball, played basketball, um, but obviously cars hadn't been in my life for a fair few years. So that sort of reinvigorated my love for cards again. And then when you, you delved more into it, you did realize that, you know, the value of cards, um, the popularity of cards was um, as big or even bigger 
than uh, what it was in the mid nineties. So, so that definitely piqued my interest. Um, started going into more razors because I thought, oh, how easy is this? I'm going to win myself a box every day. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't work that way. Um, but start to buy a few cards again. Um, I found my way into breaking. It was middle of COVID. Um, I thought it'd be something that I'd do once or twice a week, something to fill some time in. Um, it's always good to do something that you enjoy. So for me, it was just bringing childhood memories back, ripping open packs. Thought to myself, how good is this? I'm ripping open packs, uh, making a little bit of money, um, which at the time I was just reinvesting back into the hobby, you know, buying cards for myself, trading cards, um, buying some boxes, um, ripping them open with my kids, which yep. was a, a lot of fun. Um, and then obviously the breaking scene just took off. Um, middle of COVID, people at home, nothing to do, no sport to watch really. Um, and, and that's where I found myself uh, break, breaking every night um, for a period of about two years and uh, and still doing it now. So it's, uh, it's something I still enjoy and love. Um, breaking isn't as easy as what everyone thinks it is. Um, there's a lot of Can work. Can to that? Sleeving cards, sorting cards, team bagging cards, shipping cards, um, even just being on stream and seeing hundreds of questions come at the bottom of the comments and you're trying to concentrate on opening the packs and, and uh, you know, knowing who all the players are. And I, I pride myself on, on knowing something about most of the players. So I'm not just sitting there saying, oh, this is, this is Ricky Rubio. You know, I, I, I know most of their nicknames. I've watched basketball for 30 yeah. years now. And, and the, the best thing about it is, is I actually get more of a thrill pulling a card for somebody in one of my breaks than I do pulling a card for myself. Um, and I thought that that feeling would die down eventually, but it doesn't. Um, I still generally get a, a rush pulling a, a card for somebody, um, pulling a PC card for somebody. You know, you get to know a lot of these guys when they buy into pick your teams, you know, who they PC, um, who they chase. Um, just like the other day, I pulled a Charles Barkley redemption for somebody and I know that they were chasing. That was the only card they were chasing the entire set. First time opening it was Crown Royale, straight away, bang hits the Charles Barkley redemption. And for me, that's what that's what it's all about, you know, getting cards in people's hands, the cards they want to chase. Um, it's not just a, a monetary thing. Um, there are people in the hobby that do collect because they do like particular teams, particular players. Um, and when you, when you do pull those for people, it's a, a huge rush. Definitely. It's like Source collecting KZ of Parler from the Heat. So that's his... Uh... Oh. There you go. There's, there's oh, a stab I had to get that one in there. I had to get that one in there. I had to get that one Saucy. in there. Uh, <laughs> if you want, Saucy, if you want, I can get you a uh, Insincorator for your birthday and you can just put your money down the Insincorator instead of... No, mate. No, mate. I've, I've got coasters to last me a lifetime now, mate. I've got coasters <laughs> to last me a lifetime, all right? So there's, and that's that's what you'll see when you when I invite you around to my house. I'll uh, have a nice KZ Oak Parlor uh, NTRPA right there, coaster ready for you to to rest your the rest of beverage on mate <laughs> um your biggest the biggest card since you've come back into the hobby that you've pulled personally but also because you break a lot like a couple cards that you've pulled for customers okay we'll start with personally unfortunately i haven't actually pulled myself any monster cards um i uh one of the most exciting is it's not even a, it's not even a big card, but it's probably probably the one of the biggest I've pulled personally is my son collects KD cards, and uh, and we opened a box of Spectra, and we hit a KD Spectra in the zone. It's a redemption. We're still waiting for for about eighteen months, but uh, that's probably 
I know it sounds not sad, but that's probably one of the biggest cards I've pulled myself. Um, you, you better get into his uh, his ear because I mean, some of the app, the replacements that I've been seeing floating around, people have been getting. I mean, I seen some guy the other day. He got a for a Kendrick Nunn that he'd been rating sixteen months was number to ninety nine. He ended up getting a Lamelo Ball, uh, like or, or or Curry or something auto on card auto uh, as a re, as a replacement. And I was just like, yeah, I'll take the Curry or, or whatever it was. It was just it was ridiculous. Um, so I, I know he collects KD, but you might get a Curry out of it. Yeah, the, the replacements at the moment are crazy. I actually finally got a replacement for another card. Um, I had a uh, Lamelo Ball Red Wave Auto from, from yep. um, Select Timor. Now I'd been emailing Panini uh, not that often, probably every day for about the last nine months, <laughs> and I actually finally got a response last week. I sort of uh, I had a, a tip off of someone that I should actually message somebody on LinkedIn from Panini. So uh, I Smart thought, move. I Get can't lose since it's only a message. So I sent it and I got a, an email, uh, message bank on, on LinkedIn saying, listen, we'll get someone to look into it for you straight away. Yeah. Uh, I got a response from Panini the next day. It wasn't, I know a lot of people that get asked who would they like as a replacement or what have you. It wasn't, didn't get asked. I just got a confirmation that they swapped my Lamello Red Wave Auto for a Jarmorant Immaculate RPA to 25. And Thank you. I'm 99.9% sure it's on vehicle for delivery today by FedEx from FedEx. Yeah, so it, was, it, was, it was worth the nine month hassle. So, yeah, so you, you're telling me you've swapped that's a sticker auto, no? No. No, the, the no, the red wave. Oh well, who knows? He'll never sign. So, well, the 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 Timor. I'm not. I don't know. There's no bloody uh, on cards in Timor, as far as I know. I'm pretty sure that's um, that's a sticker. So I think that's a massive upgrade. I'm not not gonna. There you go. See, just prove me point. There 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 is some cracking replacements. So I've seen some. There you go, ones. ladies and gentlemen. There's a little sneaky uh, another way for you to try. You've been emailing. Uh, everyone keeps dropping Emily as the name to email. Apparently down there at Panini, uh, yeah. when she's overwhelmed, don't worry. Just find someone on LinkedIn and, and give them a whirl. I've just given away my <laughs> just giving away my trade secrets, but uh, yeah, it did work. So if anyone's been waiting a while, hit up uh, someone on LinkedIn. Just search Panini, and there's a few people that I uh, mass shot messages to. And uh, one came back with a reply, so I was very happy about that. I like it. I like it. And for yeah. some, and for some uh, clients, some of the cards that you've you've pulled for them. Yeah. So the first really, really big hit was um, the Zion NT RPA number zero one of ninety nine. Um, mm. Quite a few people might have seen the clip online. I went, I went a bit nuts. Actually broke my glasses. I was going so crazy. I, uh, you know, you flip the cards around, NT, they're back to front, and you flip them back again. I, I'd see. I saw Zion was at the bottom, um, and I saw all I saw was to ninety nine. So I was. You want to sort of rush through the cards. You don't want to give too much away. And then uh, I flipped it over and I saw the zero one of ninety nine. Uh, and at that stage, you know, Zion Zion was God in the card world. And uh, I actually had jumped up and I had flung my glasses off my face and the, the arm snapped on the floor. I was so excited. And and it just goes back to my point before, you know, it wasn't my card. It's not for me to keep, but the, the thrill that I had of pulling that for somebody else um, was just unbelievable. And, you know, it had only been probably six or seven months um before getting back into the hobby, and I thought there was no chance that I'd ever pull a card of that magnitude. Um, I know money isn't everything, but of that of that price point. Um, but I was just I was just over the moon for the person to hit that. Um, but the, the funny thing was was we had actually done an NT break, and this person had hit the Pelicans, hit nothing, and then we'd gone offline, and then he messaged me and he said, "Do you have any more?" I said, yes. And he said, I'll do a private box. So I had two boxes total and he'd actually had the Pelicans in the break. So 
either way, he was going to end up with the uh, with the Zion. So um, that was an, a, a nice one we pulled. Um, the, the same customer, I actually also pulled the uh, Jar Morant logo man from NT. Um, that was the second, yeah, the second logo what man. That I, for the same customer again, I'd also pulled a, previously a Malcolm Brogdon logo man from NT. Um, hitting a logo man just feels different. You see the logo man and, again, the rush and the thrill that you get. But obviously hitting a, a, a jar rookie logo man to five um, was a pretty big card. Um, just trying to think some other ones. We, we hit a I hit a Zion one and one one of one. Um, it was the shadow box signatures. Yep. yep. A customer. Um, he was going really hard in one on one breaks, and he said, "Can we do a private?" And we did a private, and, and I pulled that for him, which was which was very exciting. Um, you want to see everyone hit. The people that go particularly hard, um, you want them to hit more. You know, yeah, they're, well, they're, they're spending the money, hundred percent. They're spending the money. They're invested in the hobby, whether it be invested monetary wise or invested in trading, buying, selling, swapping. Um, so, you know, you always hear these stories. You know, first break I ever went into, I hit this and that, but. I also do like seeing the guys that do spend the big bucks to actually get a return for their money. So it's always it's always nice to see that. Definitely, the punt very nice. is rewarded, mate. The punt is exactly. Rewarded. That's that's some very very nice cards there. Uh, while you break, your favorite product to break, and why? Okay, this is a bit of a controversial one because oh, we like controversy. Yes, I love opening NT and Flawless and, and Immaculate, the, the, the big boys. Um, but because of the price points they're at, they can be very hit and miss. Um, you know, you're spending 10 grand on a box. You have to hit some pretty big cars to get a, a good return. I love Select Hobby. Um, I don't think it gets enough recognition. So many different nice variations, tri-colors, tie-dyes. Um, guaranteed autos, the different levels I like. I love the court sides. Um, and I just think from the boxes that I've physically opened for myself and for people breaking, that it's the best return on your investment. That's just me personally. Um, as I said, opening the big boxes is a lot of fun, but... I just really like select. It's um, it's what I like. As I said, lots of different variations, um, lots of rookie hits in select. Um, and yeah, they, they, most, uh, I don't know if this year what, what the situation is about autos in it. I don't know if they're all stickers, uh, what they're doing. But previously, it was that you know had on card autos in there as well. So you know that was one of the things that appealed to me uh, with select, you know, especially over prism, which everyone seems to go bananas over. Um, so yeah, I, I would agree with you. Select, select underrated, underrated. Yeah. I, I had, I made, I made a little jingle, which I, when I used to open select and now my kids sing it all the time. I'm going to embarrass myself here. When I'm online, I used oh, to say yeah. select, select the best a man can get. Cause in my head, it was like, everybody holds prism as like, here, but in yeah. my head, yeah. turn, I've opened a lot of prism, like a lot. We're talking about probably thousands of boxes across the years, and the return on prism is so low. Um, unless you hit a um, a nice colored variation in a hobby box. Um, a nice auto, which are quite rare in uh, in Prism. It's the the value on the boxes, in my opinion, aren't great. Um, and you look at the price on the boxes of Prism compared to Select or some other product, 
and and some of these products don't make sense to me but that's just me personally um but yeah i'm gonna stick with select your thoughts on the whole select being hobby only and then moving into retail a few years ago as well um How'd that make you feel that it, it had its niche as a hobby only product and then Panini obviously deciding to, we want some mass production on the select product and brand. So we've got to start uh, pumping out some retail. Yeah. I don't know what Panini thinks sometimes it's, um, it had, a, <laughs> no, it, it had its, it had its position on its shelf select the, as you said, it was, it was hobby only. Then in 2021, they decided to to uh, release megas and hangers and blasters, um, which then brought down the price of a lot of the, of the uh, base cars. Because even if, if you hit a 1920, if you hit a, a courtside Zion, courtside Jar, Hero, any of the big rooks, you're talking about they were like 100, 200, 300 dollar cards because you could only get in a hobby box. All of a sudden, you know, they're releasing the megas in in America, a place like Walmart for nineteen ninety nine US for a mega, and these megas were loaded with rookies. So all of a sudden, people think, well, why am I spending fifteen hundred two grand on a hobby box? Where yes, you're not going to get the autos, you're not going to get you know the tie dyes, the tri colors, um, some of the die cuts are really nice and select. But all of a sudden, all the base cards and the base rookie cards, which did hold value in select, all of a sudden plummeted. Um, and in a lot of the megas, you got the silver variations. So all of a sudden, the um, the novelty of hitting those in in a hobby box completely declined. But um, yeah, they, they have some uh, interest. They make some interesting decisions. Panini. Yeah, the the base silvers and and the base very base sort of hollow variants they just fell off a cliff, didn't they? Um, it was a interesting decision. Uh, I think something that a lot of people in the hobby weren't happy about. But at, at the same time, it's um, I mean, it's purely a monetary decision by Panini because they know it's a popular set. They want to get the popular sets into more people's hands. Um, and I mean, I, I don't think. They're worried about it. I'm, I'm not going to lie. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> it is what yeah. it is. But, yeah, I, I, look, I, I didn't agree with it. Um, I mean, we did flame him about it on, on our show. Uh, gave him a bit of, Multiple bit times. Of a jab. But, um, yeah, it, it's – they they Panini do what Panini do. Is it, It's just what you sort of learn to expect in this hobby. Um, they make some good decisions, but some decisions you just shake your head. Yeah, in, in 21, 20, uh, 2021, there are so many decisions that they made, which I looked from, as I said, I was opening a lot of boxes um, for breaks and personally, and there were some decisions with props, which I just didn't understand. You know, they try, they introduced clearly Don Russ. Um, they introduced Flux, oh, which is, you know, which is a product that was, in Chronicles, which already didn't have the uh, the greatest reputation, then all of a sudden they said, "Oh, let's 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 uh, put it as a standalone set." Um, but then they dropped off product like um, Opulence didn't come out in 2021. Um, they dropped Encased, which I thought was a pretty good product. Um, I know really? they've gone pretty hard with one on one now instead. Similar, some similar concept, obviously not graded. Um, and even furthermore, now in 21, 22, um, I'm pretty sure it's called, is it, I think it's called Portraits. Yeah. The, uh, the portraits? one with all the photos source that we talk, spoke about on the pod, how they, they kept all the, the shit photos for every other product and they're going to put all their best images in one product to try and sell it to the public. Yeah, you know, which I, I'm talking about. I think I it is portraits. I think I think it's portraits, and I, I just no, think no, 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 photogenics. 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 That's it. That's, that's what it's it. called. Yeah. Correct. That's um, the one. 
I just don't understand it. You know, if, if you've got product like opulence and in case that people like, why go try and create something else, um, which isn't going to get released till after the season's finished anyway. That's another. That's another thing. The timing of releases, um, that really irks me. Um, but yeah, I think they're just trying to pump out as many products as possible, which I understand why they've still got the license. Um, you know, they've been a part of the hobby for a very long time, so they do want to get their, I guess, the biggest bang for their buck. Um, but from uh, somebody that not only breaks but collects themselves, um, I just think there's far too much product out there now in terms of uh, different brands and products. Uh, and the timing of when it comes out is a, is a really big issue. 100%. Um, and obviously, we've seen the, that ri- rise in box prices and affordability. Now, as much as this is not a uh, discussion around the hobby, because clearly nothing really has changed, but obviously, post-COVID, there's been significant impact on, on families and people all around the world, uh, not just people in the hobby. So obviously people trying to get their bang for their buck now to just get on and live with their lives. Not everyone, but a fair majority of people because we're not all um, Drake, let's be honest, like with heaps of money. But product allocation, I'll get to in a sec, but the price point of products, the fact that they're getting more expensive or staying at the same or $100 off compared to a couple of years ago, just your thoughts on trying to get people now to continue to buy in or buy a box where we're continuously seeing that buying a box at 2000 and getting returns of $150 from the box is genuinely flushing your money down the toilet type scenarios. So just your thoughts on the price points. And let's be honest, we can talk straight about allocation as well, because obviously you've got allocation before with, with breaking. Is it a Panini issue? Is it a... Uh, supplier issue or is it a breaker issue the price the pricing yeah personally i think it's a supply issue um if you go on to a lot of the american distributor pre-sale prices i'm talking about people like the peach state gts people that you physically can't get accounts unless you were an account holder probably from about 2018 um they stopped giving international accounts, but you look at some of the prices and they're actually reasonable. I remember the, somebody having a, a login and I, I, won't, uh, I won't say who it was, but they said, listen, here's my login, go and have a look at what prices people are actually getting charged for these products. And the, I, I was dumbfounded, you know, I went online and, and Prism Hobby from memory was about $215. Um, but the huge market surge and, and, and need and wants simple supply and demand um, just purely drove prices up and, and, and continues to do so. Although the hobby has slowed down a little bit, there's still way more demand and supply um, and that allows people to, to capitalise and... The first trendsetter that sells at X price, which is generally one of the big US uh, retailers, whether it be Blowout, DA, Steel City, these guys, they'll put up a pre-sale price and um, the herd follows. Um, So the price, basically, the market price gets set. Um, Lots of people say it's breakers' fault. Breakers are buying up all the products. Um, which puts the prices up. In, in my, I'm not just saying this because I do break. Um, I wish I could get product cheaper and break it cheaper for everybody. You know, I, I wish I could buy a box of prison for 215 bucks and and break it for 350 bucks because you know we've got we've got to account for our time and accessories and shipping. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, but. The problem is, is that once that price is set in the market, everyone follows. So I I think another issue is with now Panini selling quite a bit of the hobby product direct on their website. Um, They're not selling it at the normal RRP. They're they're now selling it at market prices. 
So obviously they're holding back a lot of stock and thinking, oh, why are we going to release product to uh, at wholesale at whatever the price is, two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars, something like you know, product like Optic, even a lot cheaper, seventy, eighty dollars, when we can whack it on our website and sell a box of Optic Hobby for a thousand US. You know, we we won't release as much to uh, the distributors. We won't release as much to hobby stores and card stores. I'm talking about in America at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we'll flog it ourselves on the website direct. It's insane, isn't it? It's just, it's just mental, absolutely mental. Part um, of that is also the the Dutch auction that they do on, yeah. on some of the boxes, which you know, I mean, that's that's set by people you know, punters or whoever's buying those boxes, um, you, setting that price. And then people see that sort of price and you know, especially if it's like, oh, and they do that for, for the photo re- release first off the line. And then, you know, people will see, oh, you know, photo so for, for, for 1200. So that means, you know, the hobby box must be at least a thousand, you know, um, and they'll use that as a reference point. Um, so, uh, I mean, I I understand it. It'd be it'd be great if we could get some of that, but it just goes back to the point of you said before. You know, there's a lot of product out there. Well, then some of these other products that aren't as wanted. You know, your fluxes out there, um, and I don't know. I'm sure there's there's other products which people aren't really that. Fond Clearly, Dom Ross, Flux, uh, yeah, that hoops, sort of stuff. Hoops, you know, hoops hobby, premium. Those hobby boxes, <sighs> in my opinion, should be become a lot more affordable than what they even are now um, in a sense, you know? Uh, so I, I just think there's still room to move there uh, on, on some of the box prices. And if you have a look at the actual, the card value that you get once, you know, even some of the top end cards that you're getting out of these boxes, what they're actually selling for, it doesn't make sense. The box price that you're paying. So that's, that's where my beef is, is with it, where a lot of the market and, and, and card prices have come down. The box prices have just remained, you know, fat and, and stayed there, which is it, sort of, I don't know, it's something it's something that uh, just annoys me. I mean, I love to rip. Uh, I, I find value in AFL boxes still. I, I think they're probably one of the most valued, you know, value for money boxes that you can get on the market. Uh, that's why, uh, you know, I ripped a few boxes of Prestige. It was fun to rip. Um, and then, you know, for, for a pure collecting aspect, uh, I like to, to stick to my singles, but it'd be nice to be able to rip some, you know, some hobby boxes every once in a while and not be stung nearly a thousand AUD for an average product. Yeah. It's, um, going to your point there, it's a bugbear of mine that, you know, you'll, you'll open a, I'm going to use a high end product, for example, um, Let's just say flawless. You open a box of flawless and you hit a, I'll throw it out there, a Steph Curry auto to five. Right? You're ecstatic. Oh my God, that's monstrous. And then say you want to trade it, sell it, whatever you want to do with it, trade up, trade for a PC player. And you're like, oh, wow, it's only worth 6K. The box has cost me 25. So then you think back, what do I have to hit to get my monies back? I'm not, I'm not talking about just monetary-wise. I'm talking about to hit a card you can, again, trade, sell. If you want to keep your money in the hobby and you think to yourself, what can I actually hit? And there are very few cards in the hobby you can actually hit to get your money back on a lot of these products. So I'm not trying to push people towards breaking, but that's why sometimes breaking to me makes sense because you can buy in for that fraction of a price and then hopefully hit that Steph Curry and you can say, oh, you know, I spent 500 bucks on a spot and I hit a curry worth six grand rather than ripping a box of flawless yourself, hitting that curry and you're 19 grand in the hole. So there's a, there's a lot of product at the moment where that happens where, you know, I'll, I'll use Noir, for example. You know, single price at the moment are a little bit inflated because it's a brand new product. And everyone gets excited. And and say, for example, you hit... I was looking at the checklist the other day. They hit a sneaker spotlight. I love sneaker spotlights. I'm a big sneaker guy. Um, 
So for me, it's like a crossover. I'm hitting a car with sneakers on it. Love cars, love sneakers. But the other day, I bought off somebody a Chris Bosch sneaker spotlight. Cool card. If I hit it in a box myself, I'd be really happy. I paid 300 bucks for it. And this was from a box of 1920 Noir, which the person had just paid five and a half grand for the box. Poor. And the and the case hit is a sneaker spotlight, which is about 300 bucks. I thought to myself, that just doesn't make sense. Yes, you can hit a, a, a Steph sneaker spotlight, which, which um, you know, I think they're trading for between eight and 10 grand. You can hit a, a, a Lucas sneaker spotlight. But I think there's 28 or 30 sneaker spotlights in the series. And there's probably only three or four that are worth more than the box. And that's considered a case hit. So, yeah, I, I think it's when you're buying a box strip yourself, when you're going into breaks, when you're buying singles, it's very important for you to do a bit of research, find out what you can actually hit from the product. Um, rather than just having a, a blind shot at anything that comes your way. Like it. I, I guess that's why people have a crack at, at Raz's, mate, because in, in a sense, at least you know what you're going to get. And if it's a big card, it's a big card. And, uh, I mean, that's it. You, you, it's, it's the same sort of theory, I guess. Um, yeah, that's, that, that's why I, I'm not just pushing this because I do repack. For me, repack makes sense and for a few reasons. When I say makes sense, I'm talking about if I'm going into a repack break. You know, I was trying to explain to somebody last night. It was literally last night. You can go into a $99 break where most people are chucking in one or two hobby boxes and fluffing it up with six megas where the chance of you hitting a card value to the boxes is very minimal. I said, or you can go into a repack break where if you're opening one box, two box, three box, four box, five boxes, as long as someone shows the checklist of what's available, you can physically get cards worth more than what you're investing. So again, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do a shameless plug. You know, we, we released Mailman Repack last week. Um, we show all 50 hits in the series. And somebody that's buying into our Repack knows the worst possible card you can hit is, and from ours, I think it was a, a Westbrook blank slate. Um, and the best possible card on memorabilia piece you can hit was, was some Kobe Autos, a Luca Rookie inscribed um, Panini Ball. And to me, that sometimes makes more sense than ripping a box because you know there are actual hits there. Yeah. Yeah. We're in a box, you know, when people say case hits, trust me, I've opened plenty of cases where there are no case hits. So I think case hits are a bit of a... Uh, bit of a myth. A bit of a myth. You know, when people say, oh, you know, a blank slate, for example, is a case hit in a Cork King's Blasters. Trust me, I've opened plenty of cases where there haven't been... Um, blank slates, but I've opened plenty of cases where there's been multiple blank slates. But but people need to be aware before, as I said, buying product for themselves, ripping themselves, going in breaks, you know, these aren't guarantees. It's like when, when Panini write one auto on average in a box. Yes. But then in some how that terminology and- how that terminology has changed over the last three years. How yeah, that's changed. So, uh, you used to say one auto. Yeah, I, I tell people this, and then, you need to be careful. Then, how many reviews have we done of product source on the podcast where when we started to now, it started of, oh, yep, auto. Yep, you just read the product brief and then it got to source gone. Uh, Dom, can you just let me know if it's guaranteed? And then it's got to the point now where it's in brackets on average. The moment that it says on average means you're not getting an auto every bro every box so for people out there that if you want to know what the in brackets on average means it means you're not guaranteed an auto so you can walk away with jack shit. As well. yeah correct so uh, 
so many things have changed and uh, some things are out of control and the high-end cards keep getting uh, higher in value by the looks of things. Some of them have, um, obviously, like, for example, Jordan Rookie has plateaued and it's evened itself out. But there's one card in particular. It's got your favorite player on it. And I want you to talk about, uh, obviously, this is flavor town at the moment in the hobby this card here the john and mark michael's favorite player of all time lebron james yeah one on one <laughs> just your thoughts on this the current bid is at one and a half million usd so 1.8 million with the buyer's premium just your thoughts on this in the hobby Honestly, so, give, us your thought, give us your thoughts on the actual the aesthetics of the card first. The card, because yeah, and that because I I actually think it's pretty shit the design. But let us know what you think. Okay, I don't I don't think it's shit. Like I think I think it's very cool that you've got player worn NBA logos from kills me to say this one of the best players of all time um, from three different teams. Like I think that aspect is is cool. Um, the fact that we all know LeBron doesn't sign with Panini, the fact that it, in my head, a fact that a card that isn't signed hasn't been touched for me, that's a big thing. When there's an on-card auto, the players actually held that card. Um, I know some people don't care, but for, in, in my head, that's a big thing. The players actually held that card and signed it. Um, the fact that, you know, a product like this is literally three cutouts and they stick in three logo mans um, will eventually sell for, you know, there are crazy um, predictions, four, five, six, seven million dollars. In my head, it goes two ways. Number one, it's great for the hobby to know that there are people spending that kind of money because if people are spending that kind of money um, those are the people that will make sure that the hobby doesn't die because they can't afford for it to die. Um, because you know, these are huge investments, but for me, it's, it's crazy to think that somebody would spend that kind of money on a card that isn't signed. Yes. As I said, really cool. Three logo mans on it, three different teams that he's played for. Um, but you're talking. Where do you where do you predict it will end up? Throw out a number. I reckon it's going over five million. So yeah, when you th when you think about like what you can get in your life for five million dollars, oh, I love this discussion. This is good. Oh, you can get a card with three LeBron James logo, man. You know, it's a, it, it, it's a big toss up. Me like personally, three houses, mate. Fuck. I was about to say, me personally, I'd be, I'd be buying a house and and buying investments for the kids for for when they're older and and setting it up for their kids. Um, but as I said, it, it is good for the hobby that there are cards selling for 100%. these prices. It, it means the hobby is still going strong. Um, we spoke about surely, it surely the boxes of flawless have come down now that the everyone's got the chase card and you, you know you hit a number to five curry and it's only worth 6k so i mean you know what can you hit i mean i seen people hitting freaking number to five lamellos and only going for like 14k and that's what happens. Um, one hit in the box so, so I, how's the I, box I, still 25k i had a box of flawless sitting in my uh in my little storage, um, waiting for for mailman's breaks to um, kick off, and in my head it was like yes, and then all of a sudden the LeBron got pulled, and I was like, shit, are these boxes going to plummet? Um, and as you said, they haven't. They've actually gone up in price, which is nuts. Um, we opened ours for a customer a couple of weeks ago. We had a really cool hit. We hit a one on one Trey Young auto. Um, which the, the customer was really happy about. But as you said, the price of these high-end products are pushed up by some of these chase cards. Um, you know, we saw Drake, you know, live opening cases. You saw Ken Golden and Shine and all these guys sitting in, 
you know, lavish hotels, literally ripping case after case, looking for this particular card. I think early on, Shine had a bounty of, was it a million or 1.5 million on this card? Yeah, um, something freaking stupid. And, and at the time, everyone's like, is he crazy? Is he really going to pay 1.5 million for this card? Um, would, have, would have been a shrewd investment if he did get it for that price. Um, looking at it now, but me personally, and this is talking against what I do for a living, which is breaking cards, etc. I personally could find a lot better ways to uh, to spend five million dollars if I had five million dollars. Just your thoughts as well, someone that's been in the hobby for a while and to a lot of people that have been in it for a very, very long time. I know it's marketing um, for that card, but the way that it's marketed as it is the holy grail of all sports cards. Um, I, just your thoughts on that comment. I know it's marketing. They're trying to sell it. Yeah. Listen, uh, you can't, you can't be upset with golden for doing their job. Yeah. You no, know? Their job is to get as many people's eyes as possible on this product, on this card, and everything that they sell. So they're doing a great job, personally. You know, they've got people, again, I'm going to use the Drake example. Drake wasn't into cards. Huge basketball fan, huge Raptors yeah. fan, didn't care about cards. But always a memorabilia collector, though, Drake. You know, big into yeah. signed jerseys and, and signed shoes and stuff. I know he's got a massive collection and now, obviously, into the cards. But, but you're bringing someone like that into the hobby because, in his head, marketers, people out there are saying, let's chase the best card that has ever been created. Let's face the fact, it's not the best card that's ever been created. It might be end up being the most expensive card ever created. Do you have something that you opinion-wise think is like a holy grail worthy me, compared to that card? Well, monetary-wise value, not worth anywhere near as much. Yeah, clearly, clearly, yeah. Um, but for me, the grail always has and always will be a Jordan rookie card. Um, you know, you're talking... In my, in my opinion, the greatest player of all time is rookie compared to LeBron. Yeah, he, he's a, an unbelievable player, but this is not a rookie card we're talking about. This is a card Fair with enough. three no. patches from his jersey in it. I'm with you. I, in, in my in my opinion, I still think some of those um, Grail cards could uh, literally some of those upper deck Jordan patch patch autos or even the dual dual patch autos of him and LeBron. Um, I'd put that. They're on card. Like you said, they physically held the card, both of them to sign it and like game worn materials. And oh, I just think that surpasses it in terms. I know it's not a one-on-one and stuff like that, but yeah, that's me personally. Mate, when, yeah. when Fanatics just buys out Upper Deck and then they get that license, so that means they've got LeBron and Jordan, and then they make a dual logo man LeBron Jordan signed, that will be the holy grail. It'll happen. They'll, de they'll I'm, definitely... I'm, 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 I'm putting it on record now, so when it does happen, I'll just go back and cut this and go, <laughs> hold you so. Well, since we're moving into that uh, territory, we might as well uh, have a chat about it. Uh, um top 10 players of all time. Let's move away from cards uh, in this next part of the podcast. We've got a few other things we want to ask you about, but yeah, you're a big basketball fan. Jordan's your favorite player of all time. Have you got a top 10 for us? Your personal top 10 of all time. I do have a top 10 and as oh, this is we've cool. discussed, I'm going to write this down. We've discussed this before. I am... Um, this is a topic that comes up quite often with my mates and myself. Um, we're all very opinionated. Um, they tease me because I put some players in, which obviously we didn't see much of being the age we are, but I, I do tell them that I, I do a fair bit of research and I've gone back and watched highlights and, and, and done a lot of reading on, on NBA history. So for me, the, without a doubt, Jordan's number one. Um, no one ever... I won't say no one ever will 
come close because you, you don't know what, what, what the future brings. But I don't think anyone's ever been close to him. So for me, he's, he's numero uno. Um, it then gets interesting. I know you're not going to agree. Um, I might. We might. I, I, we might not. I've got I've got Kareem at two. Um, it's also interesting. You know, I've been. I don't know if you guys watch Winning Time. Um, I haven't seen it yet, but it's meant to be pretty good. You've got to watch it. Um, a lot of the a lot of the ways that a uh, Kareem acts around the team and what have you apparently are quite accurate. So that was a, quite an eye opener for me. But you know a guy that was supposedly coming to the end of his career and then going on a, a streak of winning championships with the Lakers. So I've got Kareem at two. Um, this one's a little controversial. I probably got Larry Bird at three. I actually didn't, when I say I didn't know much about Bird, like I knew how good he was. Um, but then when, when my mates and I were having all these arguments and discussions about our top 10 of all time, I went and, and watched a lot of Larry Bird's highlights. And I'm like, this guy's an actual freak. Um, you know, the game where he went out and only used his left hand and, and things like this. Unbelievable. Um, a, a guy that we didn't really, I obviously didn't see any of, um, but you have to go by the stats, Wilt Chamberlain. Uh, and number four, um, I've got Magic at five. Um, you know, changed the game. Six foot nine point guard. Could run, could pass, you know, in that era, really didn't happen. In those days, you're six foot nine, you're a center. Um, you know, when he got drafted, all the other all the other players of the Lakers were like, oh, this guy's going to play power forward. Um, he ended up playing center in, in a few games when Kareem was injured. Um, so it showed his versatility. You can see Dom covering his face. He's like, when am I going to say LeBron here? No, uh, no Magic, I agree, because I've seen a lot of that footage too, like when he covered Kareem at that spot. His versatility, he was literally like, he's very similar to, well, well, one of the first iterations kind of of LeBron. He could pretty much play every position, Magic. He was unbelievable. So yeah, he, he was one through five. Yeah, so he was the, uh, as you said, Le, 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 in my head, LeBron was the next Magic, you know, a guy that could yeah. play one to five, defend one to five. He's more comparable um, to Magic than what he is Jordan. Like, Yeah, jo Jordan's a, jo Kobe, Jordan's a scorer. Yeah, Kobe was the one you can compare directly to Jordan. It makes more sense, like the game styles. So that's uh, I'm not going to show away from that, let's yeah. be honest. The so. the one I've got at six is a guy that a lot of experts have around the 10 mark and don't even have in the top 10 is Shaq. Um, growing up, watching basketball in the late 90s, early 2000s, the most dominant big man you've ever seen. Big, strong, fast, very fast feet in the low post. You know, you go back and look at some of those final series and some of the numbers he used to put up were actually insane. While shooting 50% from free throw line, mind you. <laughs> shooting 50% from the free throw line, but you look at some of the games and he's putting up Mid thirties and twenty rebounds a game. You know he, he did have his uh, free throws were his Achilles heel. Same as like saying LeBron was shooting in, in the seventies uh, for a large period of his career. You can't be amazing at everything unless you unless you're Jordan. Um, I've got I've got LeBron at seven. No, you actually put him in there. Yeah, I'm just surprised he's even in there. No, I've got him in there. Oh, um, all my friends, all my friends think I hate LeBron. I don't hate LeBron. Like what LeBron can do is unbelievable. You know, he he can do everything: score, pass, rebound, defend. 
Um, my the reason why I don't have LeBron higher is, in my opinion, and a lot of others as well, you just chase championships. If in my head, if LeBron would have stayed at the Cavs, now he took some of those terrible Cavs teams to the finals. And for me, that's held higher than winning a championship at the Heat with three other Hall of Famers. You know, he got to the finals with Zadrunas Ilgauskas and Larry Hughes and Boogie Gibson and, the, and these guys. And for me, that's a bigger feat than winning a championship with Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosch and Ray Allen. You know, he literally put these guys on their backs. And I thought if he would have, when he went back to Cleveland and won the championship, if he would have stayed there the whole time, I think his legacy would have been higher than what it is now, in my opinion. I, I know plenty of people that think he's the greatest of all time. And my my opinion differs, but what, 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 what he does and what he still does at the age that he is is, is unbelievable. Yeah. Um, I also think him and a lot of these other guys, say a magic, they, they're they very lucky that they're, they're six foot nine, athletic, you know, it does give you a uh, advantage over over others, but obviously you have to work on your craft and 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 keep your body in the shape that it is. And yeah, for him, just in my opinion, building these super teams and changing the NBA and how people move around the NBA. Um, that's why I have him a bit down that's the list. Enough. That's fair enough. He's in there at least. That doesn't He's bother me where you, where, you, where you put him. Uh, yeah he's there uh at eight again obviously haven't seen a lot of him but read a lot about it watched a lot of highlights i've got bill russell purely by the amount of championships he won he had to have been good uh whenever i say that people people bring up oh how about robert horry um don't this robert horry uh he was a good player but yeah bill bill russell bill russell eight who am I missing? Uh, Kobe at nine. Um, Kobe for mine. I'm a big Lakers fan. Always have been. He was just a stone cold killer. Um, people always bring up Game Seven, NBA Finals. Who do you want? Who do you want on your team? I want Jordan or Kobe. They're the two I want. They're the two, you know, the the way their their mind works, their competitive nature, um, holds those two apart. Um, you know, Kobe Kobe went through a few lean patches at the Lakers. Um, I would have liked to have seen what him and Shaq could have done together if they stayed together. I honestly 100%. believe they, I honestly believe they could have won eight championships together. Um. I went to the Kobe talk when he was in Melbourne a couple of years ago and the way the guy worked, you know, he used to wake up at three o'clock in the morning to go train so he could make sure that he was home with his kids when they wake up and, you know, the mentality you have to have and the drive that you have to have to, to be the best. Um, and all these guys have it, you know. These yeah, yeah, 100%. Guys. Um, but yeah, for me, Kobe was... Actually, I actually can't believe I have him at nine. I should probably should have him a bit higher, but I'm gonna I'll, I'll leave him at nine. Number ten. I was thinking about this last night. I had two guys. I was tossing up for ten. Um, I was tossing up between Timmy D and Hakeem. Timmy D for just being consistent for such a long period of time, sticking to his guns. You know, the, the eight to twelve foot off the bank shot. His opposition knew what he was what he was gonna do, but they still couldn't stop him. So for me that's that's like greatness. People know what you're gonna do, but you can't stop him. Um and Hakeem, um, I thought again, growing up in the mid nineties, his footwork on the low post was just unbelievable. Um and I saw a um a thing about one of his seasons where he won MVP, finals MVP, defensive player of the year, all NBA first team, 
all NBA first defensive team, and you're like, this guy was an actual freak of nature. So um, I just had Hakeem just above Timmy D. Fair enough. So that's, my, that's my top 10 for now, but I think there's three guys in the NBA right now. Here we go. They're on the verge. So, so Steph. Yep. If Steph, if Steph ends up winning this championship in the next over the next week, um, six foot two, not really athletic, not really strong. You know, doubters when he was coming out of college out of Davidson, he's too small. Yes, he can shoot pretty well, but not unbelievably. Shoot, you know, ankle troubles for his first three to four years where it looked like he probably wasn't going to have a longevity in the NBA. What he does is unbelievable. And and I, again, I had this argument with my mates and, and they think I'm, I'm moronic, but what he does without the ball to create for others on his team, you know, the, the, when, when Draymond does the, uh, the fake handoff, two, two defenders follow Steph, Draymond goes in and, get an easy layup or Draymond and then drives and gets defender comes at him and kicks it off to clay. Um, I know he's 34, but he's still got some very, very good basketball ahead of himself. And I, I genuinely believe could finish with four, five, potentially six championships. Um, if they do well, win this. When LeBron goes there, like he's been talking about and, and, and just teams up with him in, in golden state on a vet minimum. He's going uh, back to Miami, he apparently. He yeah. wants to go back to Miami and play with Jimmy Buckets and Bam Bam. Mate, if LeBron wants to come to Miami, we'll be trading Bam out of bow for him. We'll be giving him and Duncan Robinson to the Lakers. Or well, not if he sees out the, his contract and then he goes yeah. there for as a free it agent. Could, we, it could happen, but do we want him? Guys, are you, are you crazy? LeBron's not going to go chase championships. He's never done that. Yeah, right. who's 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 the second and third person that can make the top ten? We're not getting. We're not talking about LeBron. Okay, LeBron. Giannis. Yeah, it's a nice one. I like that one. So that one I, I really do like. I know he's. A, I know it's his nickname, but he genuinely is a freak. Oh. Um, similar similar to to Timmy D. Defenders know what he's doing. I know he's building on his jump shot, and it's getting better every year. But this is a guy who's. At his size, his athleticism can get to the rim whenever he wants. He's still – people forget how young he is. Um, championships, MVPs. In my head, again, this is no – I'm not dishing LeBron, but he stayed in a small market in Milwaukee and said, no, nah, I'm going to win a championship here. I'm going to do this. Yes, he had a he had a, a good supporting cast. Chris Middleton, who I think, is a very underrated player. But what Giannis does, and how easily he gets to the rim, um, is unbelievable. And no matter what Giannis does, and I know this doesn't this isn't in the top ten talk, but whether it be an All Star game or playing for Greece. Uh, whatever it is, he's always going full throttle, a hundred percent. You can see he loves playing basketball, and I just think that he could potentially be a top tener of all time. I'm, gonna change, my, I'm gonna change my mind. There's actually four guys. Um, next one is Nikola Jokic. You're talking about a slow. That's interesting. They're talking about a slow, overweight, unfit bloke that can do everything. Literally do everything. He is probably in the top three passes in the NBA. If he wanted to, he could be the top scorer in the NBA. If he wanted to, he could be the top rebounder in the NBA. He doesn't have a supporting cast at all. Jamal Murray has been injured. MPJ has always got back problems. The last few years, Will Barton's been injured. You look at you look at his who he plays with, and you're like, in today's game, probably besides LeBron, if anyone else had these guys around them, 
they'd be a lottery team. Um, I definitely thought he he was um, going to win MVP this year. I know lots of people said Embiid was hardly done by, but when you look at what Jokic does, I just think he's unbelievable with the body he's got and the athleticism that he doesn't have. Yeah, um, fair enough. I think he's unbelievable. Um, the fourth one, getting a bit on, but KD. I knew Everything. that was going to be in there. Is it? Is it? Is a he's seven foot. He handles a ball like a point guard. He shoots a ball like a point guard. The only reason why he's probably not in the top ten discussion again, he he's winning chase championships. Um, would have been interesting to see if him, Westbrook, and Harden all stayed at OKC together. What they could have done. Probably shot each other. Too many egos. In the, uh, they wouldn't have won shit. You can't win with Westbrook. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're the four that I think could be in the top 10. That's fine. Yeah. That's not um, bad. Though. But I, I think, I think, I think Steph's probably the closest. I, I um, agree with that too. Definitely. And, and, and down the line, down the line, maybe Luca. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's got a few things to polish up on. Um, I just think I was I was kind of shattered too, like Giannis, that he I really wanted Giannis to win it again this year and have two titles, like back to back titles. He would have he would have won Finals MVP. Let's not beat around the bush. Like I know it's a hypothetical, but he would have. But just where it would have put him, it, he really would have been knocking on that door straight away. Like if he won this year, won the Finals MVP, goes into next season trying to get that three-peat. Fuck. Like, I, I just, I'm with you, Jono. He is a freak. He can do anything. He can get to the ring just with so much ease. It's unbelievable. And his jump shot's just getting better as well. It's it's progressed so much from when they got bounced two years ago. And it's better than what it was last year in the championship year. So, but who knows where he could go. If he keeps working at it, and like I said, he's young, he could be like the complete player. Yeah, in the next I, few I, seasons. I just, I just know when I say me, like how hard he works, and you know his jump shot's going to get better. Yeah, because he's just got that drive to succeed. And when defenders have to fully come out at him on the pick and roll, when defenders are going to have to come over the screen instead of going under the screen, it's game over. 100%. It's literally Completely. game over. Because as soon as they come over the screen and he takes one step towards a basket, he's, he's three foot ahead of them straight away. And he'll be complete. Well, he already is, but he'll just be completely unstoppable. Which is good. We'd like to see that, uh, for Giannis. And uh, Bucks Agreed. fans, of course. Uh, last one. I'll combine this one up because uh, you've got a massive love for sneakers. And you've got a love for memorabilia as well. So just a bit about your sneaker addiction. It is an addiction. And uh, <laughs> and your love of uh, memorabilia. Yeah. So my sneaker addiction, I was thinking about it again last night because you were giving me a heads up. There was something that or was actually this morning. You gave me a heads up. You're going to ask something about sneakers. My sneaker addiction started on that same trip that my uh, I ripped open those first uh, box of the basketball cards. Um, I remember my parents telling me on the trip that I could buy two basketball jerseys and two pairs of sh basketball shoes. At the time, I was playing basketball. Um, and for those of you who don't know, I I'm, a, I'm a big man. And I was growing out of my shoes really, really quickly. Um, so I remember they said I could buy two pairs of shoes, but it had to be different sizes because they knew that I'd grow out of one size very quickly. And I made my parents go into every single sneaker store that we walked past on this like four week trip. And I ended up buying two pairs and I know exactly what they were. The first pair I bought was a pair of Patrick Ewing's. And the only reason why I bought it was because it had a little basketball key ring on it. And I really, really wanted the key ring. <laughs> well, these, well, these really chunky high tops, which I've since went and bought the uh, 
bought the remakes. Yeah, um, I was going to say they had a re-release, didn't it? Yeah, so I bought them in the uh, – and they're, when you say high tops, they're really high. Um, and I bought – as I said, I bought them. I was a 10-year-old kid and I wanted the basketball key ring. Um, so that's why I bought the Patrick Ewings. And I bought a pair of ba- Charles Barkley's. I can't remember exactly what they were, but they were black and it had like a little white and purple zigzag on it. It was a Reebok? Where, were they they Reebok? were Reebok originally, correct. And then, yeah. he, then he went over to, to Nike afterwards. Um, and that's where my, my shoe addiction started. Um, and then because I, my shoe size was changing so often, um, you know, I went from size six to a size 15 in the space of like four or five years, I was always continually getting new basketball shoes. Um, and the earliest pair of Jordans I can remember getting were a pair of Jordan eights, um, Chicago colorway, the black with the, the, the red and the white. And that's where my addiction with Michael Jordan started. Um, I was like, I'm, I'm wearing shoes are the best player in the world's wearing. And I was like fascinated that, you know, I'm wearing shoes that Michael Jordan's wearing. Um, and then I remember getting teased at school because I had a pair of uh, John 11s, which had the patent leather on them. And, and kids couldn't understand that I, um, how do I say this without being imp- uh, politically incorrect? It doesn't um, exist on this show, so <laughs> say whatever you want. That a guy a guy would wear a pair of Peyton shoes. It was, uh, you know, I remember I remember rocking up. I bought them from a, a shop on Chapel Street called Sports Lords, which is now the Nike shop on Chapel Street. Okay. Um, and I thought, oh, how cool is this? I've got basketball on Wednesday at school, and I'm going to wear my Jordan 11s and. I was all hyped and I rocked up and everyone was teasing me for wearing these Peyton Jordan shoes, which is now one of the most iconic pairs of Jordans of all time. Um, so, yeah, for me... Tough crowd, of- tough crowd to, yeah, to please the, the, your oh, school. The, the kids kids are the most cruel cruel people, mate. They, they, <laughs> that's what it's like in uh, at school, unfortunately. If only they, if, that's if a- only they knew I was before my time. Exactly shoes, right. They were the fortune. Exactly um, so that- right. That, that's where my my love of sneakers basically started. Um, I just kept on buying more and more. And my my parents. How many pairs would you say you've got now of Jordans for yourself? Of Jordans, just just Jordans. I'm not even going to go outside the rest. How many pairs of Jordans do I have? I think just, uh, just give us a number. Well, I, I, I'll put it to you this way: I only collect. Nikes and Jordans, so I'll, okay. I'll put it in that category, and, and, and I've got two pairs of Patrick Ewings, so it's at about four hundred. Not bad. My wife, my wife's in looking, total, my wife's looking at me in the background here. Um, and well, I've got a sneaker room where I um we display all our sneakers. My wife's also a sneaker head, so that does uh, that does help. So I don't get a pushback when I buy another pair. And you share, you share, you share the addiction together. We share the Good. addiction. I never the thing the thing that actually irks me sometimes is I never thought I'd have a sneaker room, you know. And I had thrown when I moved out of home. I think I was twenty two years old. I threw out a shitload of sneakers. Because you know, I moved into an apartment. I'm, I don't have room for these sneakers. I'm, some of them you look at, I'm never going to wear again. I'm only keeping them for like nostalgic purposes. And I mm. wish some of them I kept um, to not for the monetary value, just to show my kids. You know, oh, look at this. They're bringing out a, a re-release of Jordan One. Well, look at this. I had those uh, 25 years ago. Um, so yeah, I, I'm obsessed with Jordans. I'm obsessed with Nike. Um, Michael Jordan, it, it's widely known, saved Nike. You know, they were they were on the the downward trends in the in the late '80s before they signed up Jordan, and, and now obviously they're a 
Huge Converse was the number one. I mean, they they had uh, the big deals with Larry Bird and Magic Johnson back in the day. It was all Converse. They were the number one basketball shoe. Um, yeah, well, going that, around. If you, if you uh, there was some recent uh, there was a recent interview with Magic about him turning down a, a Nike deal and what he now estimates would have been worth now throughout his his uh, career and and, and post career, and he, he was saying that it was you know cost himself over a billion dollars. Bloody hell. Um, they, they, Nike were chasing Magic Hard and they were chasing Jordan. Um, and, uh, and he signed with Converse. Um, so he, him and him and Larry wore the same shoe, just in different colors. Yep. You know, Larry in the Celtic colors and, and Magic in the Lakers colors. There's a great um, documentary. Uh, the two, I don't know if you've seen it. I can't remember what it's exactly it's called, but I, I, I literally just watched it last night. It was a great documentary uh, about the rivalry of Magic and, and uh, Larry Bird uh, and and how people people say that Jordan saved the NBA, but that's that's false. Magic Johnson and Larry Bird saved the NBA with the Showtime Lakers and the uh, rivalry with the Boston Celtics and, and how that all played out over the 80s. Um, and, and then that led into Jordan coming into the league uh, in the 70s, 80s, late 70s and 80s, and then Jordan coming into the league, obviously, in, in 84, uh, 83, 83, I think he came into the league, and then, uh, you know, took it over from there. But, yeah, great documentary. I can't, I can't remember exactly what it's called. I'll try to find it up and I'll let you know. But, um, yeah, good good doco. Definitely yeah, watch. Definitely give it a gaze. And then uh, and then, then, then for memorabilia, um. I don't know why that I have a fascination with it, but I do. Um, like basketball cards, where I said it started for me with footy cards and footy stickers, it started with footy memorabilia. Um, I'm a mad Carlton fan, and you know, baggers. That, that back in the day, you used to be able to go to training and get your jumper signed or get a t-shirt signed. I had a, had a little book which had little photos of players, and then next to it, there was a little white area. We could go get it signed. It's like a tiny little book, and there's two players per page. I've still got it somewhere. Um, I used to just love footy memorabilia and footy collectibles. Um, you know, all the all the Carlton Wegg posters, um, all the Carlton Social Club medallions, and membership cards. So the membership cards back in the uh, the early days were actually a booklet which opened, and then I used to stub. You used to have one, two, three, four, five, all the rounds. I used to like clip it when you went inside the ground for the game. And my, my grandfather and father were Mayor Carlton fans. So they they kept all of the uh, social club medallions and all their membership tickets and and their badges and 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 menus for some of the club functions, um, which they passed on to me. And that's where my love of memorabilia started. Um my first basketball piece of, uh, of memorabilia is quite a funny story. It was um, for we went to a an auction night for the local cricket club, um, and this was I'm gonna say I was eleven or twelve. So you're talking twenty seven, twenty eight years ago, um, and they had a an upper deck authenticated Michael Jordan shoe. You know, I was, Dad, please, Dad, please. No, no, no. The auctioneer gets up and they're, you know, we're raising money for the cricket club. All the money goes to them. And then, Dad, please, please, please. And then no one's bidding on this Jordan shoe. So obviously it had an opening bid, which, which was a reserve. And he goes, you know what? We'll put in a bid. And if we win, it's your birthday present. So ended up winning the Jordan sign up at X shoe. And we got home that night and, and my dad had told my mum how much uh, he had spent on this Jordan shoe. And she flipped her lid and she goes, Where, where's the other fucking shoe? And I goes, what are you talking about? Because he went home with one shoe in the, in the uh, glass, glass display. She couldn't believe that he had spent all this money on one signed shoe, which uh, I've still got today, but unfortunately the... Uh, the autograph has faded uh, considerably, sitting in my lounge room as we speak. But I'm going to say the autograph's probably only 10% there, which is a, which is a real buzzkill. 
Yep. But that's that's where my love of memorabilia um, started. Um, since getting back into the card game, um, I've I've bought a fair bit of memorabilia, probably too much. Um, but it's something in my head. It differentiates between cards because it's something that you can display in your room, display in your office. Um, my kids have started to take a fair bit of liking to it. We're, we're in the middle of working out what jerseys they want to get framed up to put in their room. So in my head, it's something that you spend money on, but it's going to be on the wall in their room. They're going to get some, some enjoyment out of it. I'm definitely going to get some enjoyment out of it. Um, I'm not going to get the chance to... Uh, put up some signed jerseys in the in the living room at home because it's just not going to happen. Um, so I tell my wife it's for the kids, um, but I just happen to be one of those kids. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> big kid. He's a big, a big kid. kid. I think we all are at heart. But, yeah, yeah. There's, I've still got a piece that's eluding, eluding me, which is a, an, an Upper Deck authenticated uh, Jordan jersey, which I'm... Um, I'm tossing up between buying at the moment. I, I have been offered by somebody local in Melbourne that's got one, um, but the the prices have just skyrocketed um, ever, ever since his doc, doco came out. You know, we saw the boom with his rookie cards, yeah. or the same boom with his memorabilia, but there's a lot less Jordan upper deck memorabilia floating around than there are Jordan cards. Yeah. Um, so I'm tossing up between buying that piece, but I do have some, I do have some pretty good pieces floating around, uh, Kobe Panini authenticated, I think it's Panini authenticated shoe, um, a lot of balls, a lot of jerseys, got an upper deck LeBron jersey. Could you believe? No, uh, I can't. 2003, 2004 rookie year Cavs jersey. Um, looking at some of it now, it's sitting next to me. Um, but yeah, for, for me, memorabilia again, they've held the piece to sign yep. it. Same as, uh, you know, on card, uh, autos compared to sticker autos for me, that, that holds some, some value. Um, I speak to some people and they, they think I'm mad when I talk about memorabilia, you know, they, they come and say, oh, it's not player worn or something like that. But for me, it's. It just brings me enjoyment, and, and there, there are a lot worse things you could be addicted to than, than sneakers and memorabilia. You're on the so, money there, mate. You're that's on the money that's, there. That's where my some of probably too much of my money goes to, but I do, I do love it. I like it. Where just finishing up, where can uh, we find you, and what's next for John O. Michaels? Okay, at the moment, um, so. Myself and Michael McCulloch and, and another friend of ours, Bobby, we're, we're running Sports Cards Addicts Australia. Um, we have been for the last six weeks, I think it's been now. Um, we took over from Lucas, who had some things going on with work and a newborn. It, was, it was just happened to be a, a freak conversation that we're having that, that led us to uh, taking over that page. Um, it's not purely a breaking page. It's a page where you can buy cards, sell cards, trade cards, talk crap about cards or NBA. Um, so it's not purely a breaks page, but um, we, we do run Mailman's Breaks on that page. We Link will be in the description. Yep. Next ne next to my name. There you go, down the bottom there too, Mailman Breaks. Thanks for the plug, boys. Um, we will eventually move towards purely a breaking page um a mailman's breaks um but at the moment we just thought it was a, a good fit to have a, a page where you could hit you can hit cards on our breaks someone else anyone else's breaks uh and, and just have a platform to uh trade those cards for trading up trading for your pc players whatever 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 tickles your fancy um We've got some things in the works for Mailman's. Um, we are going to have a memorabilia repack coming out soon. Um, purely Authentics, um, only Panini and Fanatics authenticated, which I know people hold in a, a higher regard. Um, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but they do. Um, I do too. 
Um, so that's what, what we're going to be doing. Um, we're in the process of doing wholesaling repack. Um, we've had lots of breakers reach out after we, we released our first repack on mailman breaks. Um, and I had quite a few people reach out um, when I was making repack for my previous page saying you put together a good product. Um, is this something you'd want to do? Um, but it is a balancing act because obviously we need to make a little bit of money. The next page needs to make a little bit of money and yeah. the end user needs to see value. Um, so it's the ability to to try and buy cards at, at, at good prices and having those relationships with people that, that do move on collections and what have you. But we will be wholesaling repack. Um, we've got quite a few of the big breakers on board already that want to have already flagged their interest and put in their orders, which I've had to sort of halt for a little bit because the product isn't exactly there just yet. But um, that'll be exciting to see to see our product being broken on other pages and sold on other pages. And what else? I don't know. Just uh, I'm, I'm fairly I'm fairly active on lots of the NBA pages, buying cards, selling cards. Um, and I just want to stay entrenched in the hobby. It's something that I love. It's something that my, my kids are getting involved in and and they're still young, but you know, building up their little collections. Um, and it's something that me personally I can do with them, you know, similar interests, same as, you know, going to the footy or going to watch yeah. them play sport. Um, collecting with them gives me a lot, a lot of enjoyment. Um, I, I always say to my older son, who's only seven, um, if only you knew your homework as well as you knew basketball cards and footy cards. You know, <laughs> he's only seven, but he'll tell you the difference between a hobby box and a retail box and a blaster, or a hanger, or a mega, what, what you can get in it. Um, you know, we're just ripping some 21, 22 Corkings blasters, and you just saw Corkings blasters. Oh, what blank slates are there this year, Dad? You know, didn't even need to tell him what it was. So for me, that's something that, you know, brings back childhood memories for me. Um, something that now I can financially do myself rather than, you know, having to ask mum and dad, but do it myself and then involve my kids in is a, um, brings me a, a big source of enjoyment. My wife thinks I, uh, I spoil them too much um, in this, in this instance, but, uh, yeah, my, my oldest son in particular, he's building a nice little collection. Oh and, my God. Um, it's good. Awesome. It's really uh, good, I, I mean, they learn a lot of skills. They do learn a lot of skills, uh, you know, through through the hobby and, and pick up things. So, it's, yeah, it's, they, they learn, learn to buy, sell, trade, invest. That's, that's what I try and tell my wife. But it's, it's always important to teach them. I, I try and teach them you can only trade a card for a similar car. So they're, they're, they're into footy cards and, and, and team coach is a big thing for the kids. So I said, you know, make sure you only trade a, trade a Star Wild for a Star Wild or a Magic for a Magic because you, you don't want to come home and then get a phone call from a parent. Your son ripped off my son. You know, you, you want to make sure you get one of those phone calls. He's going to be, he's going to go in there and start hustling the kids at school on the, on the trades, mate. Don't, don't joke. My, my mate and I used to, this sounds really bad. When we, were, when we used to trade basketball cards at, at school. So uh, say, for example, I'm trading with, I'm trading with Dommer. I'll say to Sauce, who was my mate, I'd say, Sauce, you tell Dommer um, that you're on his side and you're going to stand behind my back and give him the thumbs up when it's a good trade. But you're actually on my side. So I'll say, oh, listen, I'm going to trade this. Uh, I'm going to give you a Jamal Mashburn rookie. I'm going to trade it for a a Chris Webber rookie, which at the time, obviously, the, the C Webb's worth a lot more than the Mashburn. And then Saucy would be standing behind me and giving Dom the thumbs up, like, yeah, do the deal, do the deal. And uh, <laughs> we used to we used to take a couple of the kids for a ride. He's fleecing uh, I, I, everyone, I know, mate. I love it. I, I, I know we're at, the end, we're at the end of this talk, but it's just triggered my memory. I need to tell you boys one story. You'll like this one. There so we go. Very, very early days, I had a, a mate of mine that lived a few doors down and we used to spend every afternoon after school together shooting hoops, trading cards. 
And he had gone to a card shop, but he had quite a good collection as a kid. And he had traded all of his cards for a Larry Bird star brand at the time. It was called Star Rookie. And I really, really wanted this Larry Bird star rookie. He literally had traded every card he had. And I ended up trading him. There was a card, there were these footy cards called Four Quarters. So like the the size of a normal card, but they were like puzzle pieces. Okay, and, yeah. And you put the four cards together and it made like a... An image on the back. Yeah, well, it was like yeah. a, an A5 size. Okay. It made like a bigger uh, card altogether. Correct. <laughs> Correct. So I had a Jason Dunstall four quarter signature card, which at the time was worth a couple of hundred bucks, and I traded with him a uh, the Jason Dunstall four quarters and about I'm going to say a hundred two to three dollar inserts, which were all doubles, for this Larry Bird card, and it, and he had it in a screw down, which was like I'd never seen. It was like a monstrous thick screw down. It's like a 360 point thick screw down. Anyway, so I traded it, I traded it with my mate Mark. And uh, a couple of days later, I get a knock on the door and it's his mum. He's got this heavy French accent. And she was telling my parents that I have to trade this card back because Mark's decided that he never wanted to trade the card. Uh, and at the time, my parents were like, no, nah, the boys did the trade. We don't know anything about footy cards and basketball cards, but obviously they thought it was fair. At the time, it was comparable values yeah um and then when i got back into the card hobby in early 2019 i searched for it everywhere and i found it and mark has mark had always said to me that one day he's going to buy the card back off me and he's now a a very very successful real estate agent he owns his own commercial real estate agent selling some of the biggest properties in melbourne city i'm talking about hundreds of millions of dollars and and on a whatsapp group i sent him a photo saying look, look what i've got and he offered me i think he offered me five grand for it it's not worth five grand i looked it up on 130 point. i think it's about it's about a thousand dollars and he said to me like in my daily night life this is what i do now i negotiate i do deals and he goes and that one's always killed me because you won that deal so i still haven't sold it to him he offered me five x what it's worth but I'm going to make him go through a bit more pain. I'm not going to give it to him just yet. It's, uh, I think it's one I'm going to keep forever. Because in my head, I sold the for a Jason Fancy four quarters. And um, I've, got, I've got it sitting now uh, in, my, in my case with all the rest of my cards. Don't tell me it's still in the screw down. It's still in the screw down. Oh, wow. Well. That's it's funny. A thick, thick screw down. Just, it make is, him, uh, just make him wait. I don't could think he's ever going to tell you the truth. Yeah, it could be forever. Yeah. You make sure you send him just the, the last the last 10 minutes of this pod. I, I, then... I actually said to him once, I said, when NFT starts coming in vogue, I said, listen, mate, I'll take a photo of it and you can buy the photo <laughs> of me. <laughs> I like it. I like it. That's very good. Oh, that's All funny. right, Jono, thank you so much for jumping on. We do appreciate it. Um, your time uh, this morning, uh, this will obviously drop within the next week for, for those that are wondering that it wasn't on live so you could join in and berate Jono as we went <laughs> went along for the last one hour and 40 minutes but uh thank you so much on behalf of ourselves so thanks for joining us no boys thank you very much it's been a long time coming it has it definitely boys, has we need to catch up uh in real life uh saw sauce a few weeks ago and uh catch up with you soon Dummer and the boys and um yeah hang out and talk some shit definitely will uh on behalf of myself the great man source and you know keep living loving and breathing sports it's double coverage and peace so thank you ladies and gentlemen peace thank you thank you for tuning in please don't forget to leave a review on the apple podcasting app also follow us on socials instagram facebook twitter and tiktok talking old spots Double cut.